Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. It goes all my life, a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the night time till the daybreak comes around. And all my life's a circle. I can't tell you why Seasons spinning round again The years keep rolling by Good evening. This is Story by Story. Sharing the human experience. I'm Kate Dudding. And I'm Joe Doolittle. And we're here for an hour of sharing stories. The things that contribute to kind of the connection parts of our lives. And also bring a little joy and, and maybe a little humor. Oh, well, yes. Humor is always good. Okay. And Kate and I are members of the Story Circle of the Capital District, and that's a, a regional group of about 60 storytellers. You might not think there are that many storytellers, but there's at least 60. And we meet regularly, and we have a website, and this is our opportunity to share more than just our performances. And our website is story-circle.org. That's the guild part of what we do. Do we have another website? Yes, we do. Before the production side of what we do, storycircleatproctors.org. No punctuation, no dashes or anything. Storycircleatproctors.org. And they're inter, you can get from one to the other. There's a link. There are links. They uh, are cross-linked. I wasn't as much of a techie as I am <laughs> now, thanks to Kate. Um, what we're going to do in the next hour is we're going to share some commentary about what's going on in storytelling and what storytelling is. Uh, then we're going to have a, a guest teller. Uh, Marnie Gillard is going to join us, mm -hmm. and she's going to do a little bit of a reprise on her own career as a storyteller and one particular character that, uh, that she's made the acquaintance of and will share with us. And uh, we're going to reflect on our season of storytelling mm -hmm. performance, which has just been really one of the best I can remember, or, although my memory is not what it used to and, be. And we were so lucky, despite all the snow this past winter, we were not snowed out any production. No. Nope. We, we, we boldly make a schedule from, from September through April, just hoping that, that those December, January, and February, and March events will actually happen. But they did all this year. And, it, and one of, we're, we're filming this today in the library at the Town of Colony, the Sanford Library, and one of the bellwether events of storytelling took place right here mm -hmm. uh, as part of the Riverway Storytelling Festival. And if you listening out there or watching out there missed the Riverway Storytelling Festival, don't miss it next year. Yes, there were over 2,000 people who enjoyed the seven days of Riverway this year, but the biggest day was here at Colony, where it started at 9.30 in the morning with workshops and ended at 10 o'clock at night after, I think it was four different performances, or maybe five. Uh, so it was a jam-packed day oh, and, and some story swaps, and with stellar tellers both local and uh, from afar. And, and what's a story swap anyway? It's where people usually sit around in a circle and one at a time they tell a story. Mm -hmm. And some, sometimes it goes, oh, that reminds me of a story. And that's the next person that goes. And that's somewhat like what happens at a regular meeting of our Story Circle Guild because mm -hmm. storytellers will bring material to those meetings that take place here at the Colony Library on the third Tuesday of each even month. No, it's on nice the odd throw. month. On you the you odd were month. doing so well. I was well. doing so well. <laughs> it's odd here in Colony. Yeah, that no, I no. Okay, <laughs> so, so it's the third Tuesday of the odd months, like that would be in May, will be here in Colony at 7 to 9. Show up, listen, yes. tell a story, try out telling a story, meet folks interested, and it's just a wonderful opportunity. And in June, it'll be the third Wednesday of the month, mm -hmm. and it'll be over at the Gilderland Library. And, and that's Unless we couldn't get the booking, check the website, check under, website. Me under meetings. But mm -hmm. we want to really issue an invitation mm -hmm. for you to, to 
get more involved in some of the storytelling activity. And on that website will be activities for the whole summer that will be up mm -hmm. and running. And, um, but when I think back on, on, on things that have happened for us in storytelling, um, I think some of the best events have been things that have happened on this show. I really, I really think so. Um, and we've had some wonderful tellers as our guest tellers. And Kate, help me here. Um, are we alive on the web with anything? Oh yes, <laughs> I, I I knew he was he was throwing, I I was something, throwing something to me, but I, it took me a little while to to I fumbled a little bit. Oh yes, we are. We have our own YouTube channel, Joe. Own, own YouTube channel. Yes, at if you go to storycircleatproctors.org and click on YouTube, you get to a list of our stories. We now have. 16 different storytellers sharing 29 different stories. This is, was started on February 21st, and we have had nearly 1,100 stories downloaded by, we don't know who, but we hope one of them was you. That's right, that's right. Now, I, I've been reprising a little bit about the season. Uh, do you have a, a special memory you want to share? And then we'll kind of get into our, our guest teller. Well, I'm rather proud that we finished our 12th season at the Glen Sanders Mansion. An even dozen of programs there, six to eight programs a season. Yeah, that was really, that is kind of, that just kind of happened when it started. And, and you and I have kind of been the, the godparents of that. And what's nice about that is, is I like to go to potluck suppers. And this is really a classy potluck supper at the, at the Glen Sanders Mansion, don't you think? Well, I think, well, you, you have a choice of three different entrees, and, and what you get for your salad and your dessert are the chef's choice. So I guess in that sense, it's, it's a potluck. But in between the courses of food, there are courses of stories. Mm -hmm. And stories and food is a really good mix, I it really, think. It really does mix up. But what I like sometimes best, the stories are wonderful. But sometimes the, the conversation level of all those people just sitting around, why we joke that we have to blow a whistle sometimes to start the next set of stories, but really there's a lot of friendships that have been mm -hmm. developed in the course of those conversations. And, uh, and that's kind of the other music to my ears. Right, and when the program is over, Half the people don't go. That's, that's <laughs> they continue the talking yeah. to the people they came with, to the people that they've just met, to the people that they met two months ago. And uh, yes, the, the, the fellowship was not something we had anticipated, but something that we very much enjoy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of fellowship and, and friends and good-natured relationships, our guest teller is in that category for both you and I, don't you think? Oh, she's very friendly. Yep, yep. Knowledgeable, <laughs> um, oh, nifty. What what else <laughs> can we say nice about Marnie Gillard? It's it's hard to say bad things about Marnie Gillard. Marnie Gillard she is. She could be a little taller, but it, eh, oh, <laughs> you don't really notice nope. it unless you're standing next to her. Well, <laughs> well, we did find out something, didn't we? Okay. <laughs> Marnie Gillard is is one of the most excellent teachers that has been the gift to the Disc Unit School Districts. And, uh, nurturing. That's nurturing, another. <laughs> nurturing. Uh, and I first heard of her uh, as the teacher of my kids. Uh, good reports coming home. And then as I got into storytelling, I became even more encouraged by her flair and enthusiasm for both finding the right story and telling the right story and also bringing her persona. That's the whole combination of your being and your personality together in our stories. Marnie, we are really glad that you're here today. Welcome. Well, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Kate. It's always a blast to be on Story by Story. <laughs> well, we would like to think so. And, you know, the thing that I was just remembering that I couldn't remember is I, I don't remember when you actually started or realized that you were a storyteller. Oh, I know exactly when I started. I went to a 1983 workshop down at State University of Oneana that was uh, put on by our not yet developed story guild. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really just an idea in people's minds and they had connected up with people in Oneana who had a guild. And I went to the very next meeting after that day and I went hoping to really just be a listener. <laughs> we, we hear that a lot from people, can I just come to listen? And yet uh, all of the stories that were in the room got told and we weren't done yet. So they said to me, what would you like to tell? And I said, I don't know. 
uh, I didn't really plan to tell anything. And Janine Laverty, a wonderful teacher also in this area and a wonderful storyteller, said, well, what's something you read to your class every year? And I said, oh, like something I read to my class? Well, I'm in junior high. I, I, I'm not reading picture books too often. I, I read different things each year. But The Mountain Whippoorwill is a poem I read to my class every year. And Janine said, is it a story? I said, yeah, but it's a big, long poem. I don't know it by heart. Mm -hmm. She said, could you just tell us <laughs> the story? And I didn't know how to get out of it. <laughs> didn't so, know how to get out of the story. So I, I just brazenly stepped inside this world that I had recited as a three-page, three-ditto mm -hmm. sheet pages uh, poem by Stephen Vincent Benet, The Mountain Whippoorwill. And I suddenly really saw all the images in the story in a way I never had seen them all these years reciting it, reading it with my kids. Mm. So that inducted me big time. Big so you time. had to, because Janine put you on the spot, which Janine normally doesn't do. Very but, lovingly, yes, very, very lovingly, kindly. Yes, yes. But you were able to bring it back through your being as opposed to off the Mimeo page. Absolutely. There was, I, I did know some of the lines mm -hmm. and I was able to start it like a poem mm -hmm. and then I would just go into remembering it, mm -hmm. really remembering it as if it were a mm -hmm. memory. It's mm -hmm. about a boy at a fiddling contest mm -hmm. and uh, he sees the three kingpin fiddlers and his confidence gets smaller <laughs> and smaller and then in the end after he plays the kingpin fiddler hands him his fiddle and then the noise of the crowd began. And mm -hmm. that's the last line of the poem. And mm -hmm. you realize the boy has wowed them mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was a very first telling. <laughs> that was a first telling. And then after that, I committed to going back and, and learning those mm -hmm. words so that uh, I could really have it as a story, but really be true to the poem. Well, actually, and, and, and every story needs a, a plot line. And what you did is you borrowed the plot line from the poem. That's exactly what I did. And adapted that. And in learning theory, when you adapt something, you make it more your own than it was originally. That's exactly right. So then you've got yourself a story when you couldn't remember the poem. I'm still not a storyteller who goes by remembering the words. I'm not a memorizer. Uh, there are storytellers who are, but I'm a... I'm, uh, somebody who gets the pictures in my mind and then gets a, a group of listeners out there interacting with me. I, I really like to read the energy of the audience, whether they're four or 104, and ride that energy with them and, and we make that story up together. Have you given any thought to how the energy happens between you and the, uh, the audience? I've given a lot of thought to it, but it's a big mystery. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big, I look at faces, certain faces that are with me, and I kind of draw from them. Uh, but other people are looking like this. It doesn't mean they're not into the story. Sometimes they're just really trying to see it. One time a fifth grade boy had his head down the whole time I was telling a story. And I thought he was tuned out or even dozing off, and he didn't have ear pods in right. or whatever. At but least. <laughs> he, uh, he, wasn't, he didn't seem like he was with me. The minute I finished the story, he looked up. He said, I love that story. And it was like he couldn't look in my eyes. It was too intense for him. He just mm -hmm. looked mm -hmm. down to be able to make the pictures in his own mind mm -hmm. and enter the story that way. Right. And, and sometimes you just don't know. Some, some people's p faces at repose are not the most encouraging to you, but the in t in, inside. They Absolutely, very much a lot is happening inside. But when mm -hmm. the people go, they're not, or they... Those are the ones that are really fun to look at, <laughs> right. and they, they kind of keep pulling the story out of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it's interesting. I was trying to think through myself whether I'd ever had the kind of uh, involvement in a storyteller that I've had, if I had that same experience in the movies. And mm -hmm. I don't think I have. I mean, as, as engrossing as movies can be, it's, there's a different energy live. Um, and maybe you've felt it differently, although I think that that, that intangible interrelationship happens more fully in the live situation than it does in a, in a, in a movie or a television, for example. 
Um, but they're all stories. If a, mo if a movie or even a television show really hits me emotionally, I can get lost in it. And when it's over, not so much a TV show because there's ads, but in a movie, I can, at the end of the movie, when the lights come up and it's like it takes you a minute <laughs> to come back mm -hmm. to right. the present moment. Mm -hmm. Now, I talk with teachers a lot about um, it's a wonderful thing to read a book to children and hold up the pictures. That's, it's a wonderful thing. But there's something beyond that with no picture, no book in between, when you're just deeply connected to the children mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in front of you or, or adults. And somehow you know that together you're creating this. It isn't something that's in a book that somebody else made. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, a, it's a powerful uh, thing. And some people have done research on that trance mm -hmm. that you can go into as a story listener. Mm -hmm. It's psychologically powerful and healing, really, mm -hmm. in some ways. Right. Uh, I told some uh, stories to a middle school science class once. I, a friend of mine was the teacher, and she had them for the double period around lunchtime. And so I, I told for like 45 minutes of stories, and then I left, and she had them for another 45 minutes. She said, that trance you put them in, it lasted almost the whole second the period. Whole second period. <laughs> and she said, and the two who fell asleep, well, they always fall asleep. Uh, and, and for those listening out here, we're talking a little bit about the, the art of storytelling performance. Although, the, the nature of that relationship, if, if you get grandma talking about her childhood around a dinner table, you'll notice that the moments get held in almost the same way we're talking about. And, Absolutely. And those memories get etched by the stories, I think. Although, Marty, you know, you know, you've done a really wonderful job of some of your own personal stories. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious whether some of the stories about you and your dad or growing up in Fulton, New York, right? Up, Fulton, New up York. Up in the snow belt, yeah. That's right, um, central New York. When did those begin to arrive in your storytelling repertoire, or were they always there? I mean, just talk a little uh, bit about Because I was first introduced to storytelling by people who were really into myths and folk tales, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that is that's the deep work of the ancient stories. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really know, is that allowed? Can you tell a story about your life? And uh, a storyteller named Donald Davis, who's mm -hmm. very well known around the country, mm -hmm. came to the uh, Glens Falls Library. And when I saw him, he was telling only right. life stories, stories about his boyhood, which of course brought up all the stories in my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I started out with a story that I've recorded on my uh, CD. Mm -hmm. um, can I show yeah, it show here? Just pick it right up. <laughs> and you can even see me as a little girl on the That's diving you. board. That's you on the diving board. That's me, red oh, cap, little ruffles. ruffles on my bathing suit bottom. Um, I called this tape Without a Splash, Diving into Childhood Memories, because my first story was doing my first high dive. We, we got a great photo. It's not a high board. It's a low board. But my first big personal story was my, uh, my first high dive. And that story has stayed with me now 20 years. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's really archetypal in that it, it sets up uh, who I am as a person in the world, uh, my relationship with my dad, mm -hmm. with the swimming pool. My dad mm -hmm. was a diving coach. And mm -hmm. so there's a whole lot about me in that one little life story. Mm -hmm. But, and I think, if I'm recalling correctly, I heard you tell that story at Riverway, oh, a few years ago. You were in the bird section of the New York State Museum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you were telling your story, but you kept on bringing the third graders in by saying, have you ever had a moment that you really want to do something, but you were really scared? Something like that. Yes. And, and they were with you. you. You brought them into your journey. It was, it was, I rem it was so magical. It's, it's a story that's evolved with me greatly. I've, I've actually written a lot about this, the evolution of a story when mm. you tell it over time. And at first, it was just a life story I told about myself. But because I knew about participat participation, participatory stories, with, especially with young children, mm -hmm. it's a way to keep them engaged if they get a little antsy because mm -hmm. it's a long time to listen. Uh, 
one little girl, when I was on the diving board, shivering. <laughs> she started shivering with me. Thank so you. I said, let's all shiver. <laughs> and suddenly that was in there. And then little by little, there were other things that came in. And now I've learned that uh, I can throw in participation in almost any kind of story if yeah. I've got really young listeners with older listeners who want the adult version. But I got to throw a bone to the kids once mm -hmm. in a while so they stay with me. Mm -hmm. Uh, that happened a lot at Riverway this year mm -hmm. uh, over in Rensselaer's library. Okay. We had a lot of fun, mm -hmm. a lot of fun. And, and one of the other kind of uh, learning points here is that, that stories that you tell are, are changeable, they grow, they, they aren't the same story you told last week. Um, and I think that uh, that's another way of saying we aren't memorizing these stories because we expect them to be shaped by the current situation and what's been happening with me and, and those kinds of things back and forth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, You know, there's a poem about that that I learned at my very first storytelling workshop. A poem that... that That's about this idea of staying with something and allowing it to evolve. Would you it, like to hear it? And it's been a reference, I bet, ever since that first time. It has been a deep and powerful anchor to so, my I, work. I, I, is this like on a, are, this borders on a trade secret you're about to divulge? It actually this? isn't a secret. Oh, okay. I think it's a poem that's been published okay. in a widely published book. And, and Janine Laverty actually introduced me to mm -hmm. this poem. At first, when I read it, I wasn't quite sure what it was about, but I stayed with it. It goes like this. It's um, by a poet named John Moffat. And it came from a book for me. I think he published it in one of his anthologies. But it came from me from a larger anthology called Reflections on a Gift of watermelon pickle and other modern <laughs> verse which came out in about the 60s but it's a great book of many poems for all ages and it goes like this to look at anything if you would know that thing you must look at it long to look at this green and say I've seen spring in these woods will not do you must be the thing you see you must be the dark snakes of stems and the ferny plumes of leaves. You must enter the small silences between the leaves. You must take your time and touch the very peace they issue from. Now, for me, that's about this thing of staying with something, the dark side of it, as well as the bright side of it, and listening really for that magical thing, that mysterious thing that happens with you and the audience. And the story came out my mouth completely differently that day because of that audience and that magic. Mm -hmm. And um, I've just been grateful for that poem because it reminds me you have to keep looking mm -hmm. long at any story. Mm -hmm. Well, you've done that work, looking long yeah. at certain topics or uh, a particular life of a character. Right. And, and Jackson Gilman, I took a workshop with him at the New England Storytelling Conference, uh, said that after every performance, part of his, his job is to write down anything that happened that was new mm -hmm. and then to consider does did he want to continue doing that mm -hmm. because it, it worked so well that particular time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I thought that was a good good practice to remember. Well, the whole practice of being reflective mm -hmm. really is mm -hmm. is a lot of what that poem is about yeah and, and being uh, being open to the to inquiry to to look for the spaces in between and to think long and hard, and I guess the most profound thing is is to be the thing itself. I mean, that's a a really powerful line of of things because if we are ourselves, we're trying to be the thing that we are, and if we're trying to do uh, a story or a or or act or a character or a painting, um, that's a very powerful, uh, helpful, helpful poem. Mm -hmm. Thank you for but, that. And, but that reminds me of the song from Chorus Line, where uh, Chorus Line is a musical that was actually made up of interviews that right. uh, about 
cor members of chorus lines of how they got started. Mm -hmm. And one of them was about, she was in a performing arts high school and, and in a drama class, be, she was Puerto Rican background, be a toboggan. <laughs> it was like, hello? Hello? <laughs> What's a toboggan? Right. And, and so uh, she did a lot of reflection and, and the reflection was, get a different teacher. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you try to be something, and it just, it just doesn't, you know, so not all, every story is for every teller. That's right. That's mm -hmm. very, true. very true. That mm -hmm. when you find a story, it's got to hook you. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe in assigning people stories to learn. One of, one of the works that you've done and are developing is a, is a, a piece about Grace O'Malley, the Pirate Queen, uh, and I'm, I must say I'm captured by this and have been kind of a, an adjunct. <laughs> captured by a Pirate Queen? I'm intrigued by this because I, I've, I've seen the performance early on and then we've helped you produce it last year and we're doing another round coming up. But when did you, when did Grace grab you? When did you meet Grace O'Malley? And tell me a little bit about that. Tell us. Well, um, I've been interested in Irish stories uh, for a long time, but I kind of held myself away from them because they weren't really part of my growing up tradition. I, I was reared on Harrigan and Irish Eyes Are Smiling songs about the Irish, but not really the old Irish stories. Uh, Though your family is of Irish Oh, big, yes. time. big time. Mohegans, Walches, uh, McGoverns, Gillards, oh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of Irish sides, yeah. Uh, but one year, instead of going to the National Storytelling Conference mm -hmm. one summer, I went down to something called the Swannanoa Gathering at a school in North Carolina, and they have a week-long uh, study of Celtic songs, music, and there was a little bit of story, and a friend had been luring me for years to come down to it. So I, I showed up, and there was really only one storytelling class, but it was given by an Irish singer that I came to admire a great deal. So I took the class and I took her uh, class on singing and she had a lot of tapes for sale. So I bought one of her CDs, her name is Kathy Ryan and she's really one of the most respected American Irish singer singing Celtic uh, material. She's a, uh, her own songwriter in many ways but she also does a lot of the ancient old songs and sings in Irish, sings in Irish as yeah, well as English. Uh, and she had a, a CD, which I brought along because I knew you'd ask me this question, Joe. Mm. It's called uh, Kathy Ryan, Somewhere Along the Road. And she signed it to me. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience meeting Kathy. And any chance I get, if she comes into the Northeast at all, uh, I try to go see her. She had a song on this CD called Grace O'Malley. And I was listening to it. It was like, oh, there was this sailor queen and she got called Grand Nuel as part of her nickname and she met Queen Elizabeth who said oh you could be one of my countesses and she said no, I don't want to be your countess I'm as great a queen as you and it was just a song that I sang in the back of my mind and enjoyed thinking this must be some historical character then I was reading some Irish literature uh, there's a Morgan Llewellyn is a woman who takes Irish history and writes it in fictional mm -hmm. form novel form and I was reading a bunch of her novels and came across a novel called Grania. And it had a picture of a pirate woman on the cover. And I said, I wonder if this is the pirate woman <laughs> that's in that song. And I turned it over and sure enough, the true story of Grace O'Malley with lots of fictional details. Yeah, just like them. And so then that book led me to another book uh, by Anne Chambers, who did actually all the homework of going into the archives and finding everything you could find out about. Uh, Grania Ni Mali would be the way her name was in Irish. And only over time have we anglicized it to Grace O'Malley. But in her time, Grani Nimali, there's probably 25 ways they spell it in those days. And eventually she came to be called Granuel because of something that happened uh, in her girlhood. Uh, has a little play on what happened, and that's her nickname that came with her. And then, of course, your friend, uh, right. Tom O'Hare, wrote an amazing suite of music called Granuel, a notorious woman. Well, actually, and, and 
And I suppose if this has several chapters in it, we're, we're about to go into chapter four. <laughs> uh, but after I'd heard uh, at a story Sunday several years ago, I'd heard Marty uh, do a little of Grace. And well, uh, three sets. Three, three sets of Grace. Three sets. Yeah, like an kind of a and medium and a of Grace. Of grace. <laughs> and I was just visiting an old college buddy on my way to Boston and uh, having coffee, and I asked him what the most interesting thing he'd been doing. And he says, well, probably writing a cantata about Grace O'Malley. And I just about fell off the chair. So I hooked you two guys up. And uh, we've got a, a wonderful friendship with Tom now. And finally, we just said, if we're going to put this together, we're going to put this together. And it is magnificent. But I don't want to spoil it and be too effusive. Because I want to, because a couple of things I think have happened. Um, well, the music and all that has happened. But when you do grace unlike other characters you know about the fourth line somehow you are grace you, you've mm. you've gone from being marnie and that's different than telling a story in the third person i mean you've stepped into a, a first person i want to say guys and and i guess my next question is is that hard well it is hard and i'm learning a lot about it through this story uh as a storyteller in general, you do want to play with characters, even though you're telling in the third person, as you say. But one of the things I learned from my own life stories, when I'm telling about the little five-year-old, actually four and three quarters, mm -hmm. uh, standing on the high diving board, I enter her body and try to feel her four and three quarter year oldness you as much her, as I can. You feel her shiver. I feel her shiver and I feel her looking at her town for the first time and seeing how big it is and how far the water is. Mm -hmm. And then at nine, I have a story about my nine year old fourth grade experience. I really try to remember the fourth grader. And at 13, I have a couple of stories about my 13th year. And I try to remember that I've, I've grown up. And those three girls, the 13-year-old, 9-year-old, and, and 5-year-old, they communicate with each other in some magical way inside me. So the fourth grader can say things now in that fourth grade story she never could have said in real life in fourth grade because the 13-year-old has taught her how to be a little more talk-backy. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've loved all of our talking about stories, but could you tell us a story? We're halfway through our program. Oh, and, wow. And, uh, I'd love to, and I'll take a, a little introduction to the Grace story, so uh, okay. you'll have a chance to meet her. Okay, thank you so much for that. <laughs> Granya Nimali, 12 years old. The year is 1542. She lives in a time where explorers are roaming the world, and sea captains trade upon the sea, and pirates show up as well. Now her father, Duvdara O'Malley, was the great clan chieftain and highly respected man, a tall man with long black hair pulled into a ponytail. And he was a great leader of his clan and his daughter admired him with every fiber of her body. Duvdara, his Christian name being Owen, was married to Margaret O'Malley, her very elegant mother who ran the roost and took care of things about the clan when her husband was off on the sea trading the goods that the Irish people had to sell and bringing back all kinds of treasures from spices to silks to Spanish wine on uh, his trading journeys. And the other thing the O'Malley's were famous for was that they guarded faithfully the territory right outside Clue Bay where their castles were and that was the Atlantic Ocean. So anybody wanting to pass through as traders uh, through their personal waters or use them as fishing trade uh, paid a tax to the O'Malley's. And of course, friends got to pay a little less tax and uh, people like the English, well, they paid a higher tax or they donated much of the merchandise on their ship to the O'Malley causes. <laughs> Rania O'Malley, one day, 12 years old, 
She waited for her father's ships to come home. She just knew today was the day. She had a big dream in her mind that night, and she'd seen the sails rounding the ocean into Clue Bay, and she just knew that today was the day after months of travel. Of course, her mother back in the kitchen was yelling, Grania, get in here, finish your oat cakes. There's no way of knowing if your da will be home today. It's just a dream, girl, just a dream. Get in here and you've got chores to do as well. Oh, ma'am, I just know he's coming. I saw him in my dreams and I've got, I got a secret. <laughs> I got a secret surprise I want to share with him and, and you too. Uh, but, but I'm waiting till he gets home. I, I know it's coming. Oh, Bridget, oh, Bridget. Ah, oh, young Grace, she remembered Bridget the goddess that she'd heard of from all the stories of the ancient times, and Bridget the Catholic saint as well, for she was a Christian girl raised by the monks and taught to speak both Latin as well as Irish, which played out very well in her life later on. Now, when she finally spied him coming around, she said, oh, they're here, they're coming, I told you, Mom, I told you, I told you. And she tucked her big long skirts and ran down to the shore where she'd climb in her own little cura, a little small leather boat, uh, handmade and ready to just take a little girl right out there on the sea. Now, Grace was different. Grania, Grace, we call her both. She'd learned how to swim, taught herself how to swim, was right there elbow to elbow with all those sailors unloading the ships and they'd tussle her hair and pick her up and throw her around loving her like a child like a granddaughter or a daughter and she was part of them whenever they came home but this day as soon as she could get her father away she hooked her arm in his and ran up the hill to see her mother and he was happy to be home to see his wife and while mother and father we're having a wonderful little reunion. Father was away at sea for a long, long time, just holding each other and talking to each other and him bragging about all the things that he'd brought. Grania went behind a big oaken barrel where she had hid her surprise. She pulled on sailor's trues, the pants of a sailor, pulled down her big long skirt, put on an overblouse that was all puffy and billowy like the sailors would wear and made sure she'd found one from one of the sailors nice and small of stature so it fit her just fine at 12 years old. And then she had her bandana which was going to tie around her hair so she'd really look like a sailor. But first she had a job to do. She picked up a knife she carefully sharpened and took her long black braid, chop, 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 chop and even any little lengthy parts of her hair she hadn't gotten in the first chop. And Grania Whale, Grania Mall, Grace the Bald, was born that day. She tied her bandana, of course, to keep her mother from the shock all around her hair, and then dashed off and broke up the hug between her mother and father and said, look, Da, I'm ready to go to sea. I'm gonna be a sailor next time with you. I'm 12 years old now old enough to go to sea, I know I can be a sailor. Her father's eyes got wide, looking out of the corner of his wife, whose face was pale as a ghost. Guess it wasn't going to be the homecoming he really <laughs> looked forward to. What is this, said Margaret O'Malley. What, what, what are you talking about, girl? You're not going to sea. The sea is a woman herself. She's jealous of any other woman being on board the sea. The sailors themselves, they call it the devil's ballast, the devil's weight. If a woman should be on board, oh, it's bad luck. They don't ever want to see a woman on board. The sea wants no part of you, girl. Oh, no, Di, you tell her. You tell her how you've taught me about the sea how to see the sky and read the wind and know just how to take care of the great galley ships so they can tuck away in case a storm comes. You tell her how I know about the sea and the sea's been calling to me. Oh, Dubdara's face is getting pale now too, <coughs> looking at his wife, looking at his daughter, how much he dreamed of his daughter being at sea. Maybe that had somehow come across to her a little too strong. Well, girl, no, no, you're not going. You're not going because if it's not the sea, then it's the men. I won't have my daughter on a 
sea ship with those men. You put a little liquor in them and they're worthless. And Dovdara's face begins to change. These are his men she's talking about. Oh, no, girl, no. I won't let my daughter near one of those. No, no. They, they tear you asunder is what they do. And pretty soon, now his face was getting red and his eyes mattered in a hornet. He pounded his hand down in the kitchen table and said, not my men. They're wonderful guys. I know they're rough around the edges, but they wouldn't cross me not for a second. And this girl, they love her like a daughter. They cherish her with their life. No way they would hurt her, not for a second. I say she's going. And she did. And months go by, and there is this young girl sailor. You can hardly tell her from any of the men, except that she's, uh, she had some stature to her, but uh, she was a little on the scrawny side. Her favorite thing when they weren't scrubbing away, which she did with all the sailors as hard as any of the men, she'd climb up the mast. She'd hide herself in that crow's nest up above. And she'd fantasize about being the goddess Bridget, or maybe the Morgan turning herself, shape changing into a great crow and diving down and taking part of all the ancient Irish battles. Oh, she loved to play, but she was a good worker too. Now she'd promised her mother one thing, that if any trouble came to the ship, she'd always go below. She'd promised it, sworn in the Bible, her father as well. But one day when trouble did come, when pirates, and the O'Malley's could be pirates themselves, but they flew the O'Malley flag. But no, these were the dastardly kind of pirates, the ones only out for blood and money. Their grappling hooks came up around the edge of the ship, and suddenly they were all over the deck like rats and Grace was way up high. So she was out of harm's way, but she could see below her the great tumult of the fight, all the sailors defending their territory and those pirates wanting to take the ship. Then, as she inched her way down, she saw her father boldly defending himself and anybody behind him, but then out of the distance out with a, a long sharp razor sharp knife came right at his back and that little girl she turned into the morrigan catch her all and flew right out of the sky landing on top of that pirate's back and when her scarf came off and her now growing back long hair flowed over his face he dashed her to the ground saying ah it's the devil's ballast the woman on the sea get out of here and they were like rats again just leaving the sea and grace o'malley grace the ball grania mall grania whale saved the day for the o'malley's that day <laughs> end of episode wow. one wow <laughs> wow oh, i think <laughs> I think we need to go to coming attractions <laughs> because... I think we do, <laughs> just because... And then we'll come back to yeah. Grace. Yeah. But we will. Because, we will. Because there's an opportunity to yes. meet Grace at length. That's yes. right. But but first we have to take a minor detour, to because first coming up in May on Monday, May 9th at the Storytelling Open Mic in Saratoga Springs at Cafe Lena, Mark, our friend Margaret French oh. will be the featured teller. And so she'll do about 20 to 30 minutes of stories. And before and after her, other people will be doing that. And it's a very modest cost. And Cafe Lena is a historic place. And they sell coffee and cookies uh, for a mere buck. So that's not to be missed. And that's just a wonderful atmosphere and some wonderful tellers in addition to Margaret. So mm -hmm. come on up to Saratoga. That'd right. be great. But back to Grace O'Malley. Oh, you got a little preview here of, of Marnie's magnum opus, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but there will be a pub preview on Sunday, May 22nd at 7 p.m. at Carney's Tavern in Ballston Lake. And Marnie will be there with Fiddler Hillary... Hillary Sh Shruff. Shruff, yes. okay, Shruff. of Lawson. And, and she's a traditional Irish musician who is part of the musical cantata as well. Uh, 
but she'll just back up Marnie with some stories and some of the introductions to the piece, the pieces that are part of it. And Carney's is a lovely place, great atmosphere, mm. fine food. Uh, that'll be, uh, there, there'll be no ticket for that, but there will be a, a suggested donation at the time, and we encourage people to come and, and, and savor both uh, Grace and a little bit of Carney's. Mm -hmm. Okay, but for the full-blown uh, extravaganza, because that's really what it is, it's what it's grown to be. I saw it last uh, May, I believe it was, and it's just such a wonderful combination of stories and music. And the music interludes between the six episodes of Grace? Six episodes of her life, right up to when she was uh, 60 years old and met Queen Elizabeth. Mm -hmm that the, the music gives you time to reflect on the previous episode. The music brings you into the, the spirit of it. It's, it's, it doesn't have any food, but other than that, it's a perfect experience. And so it's at Proctor's. And it's at Proctor's, the GE Theater at Proctor's, Sunday, June 5th at 7.30. Right, and we hope to, we've not done this production at, at Proctor's. Uh, part of the, the setting is to bring it really to the more uh, formal theater. Um, and we're really hopeful that people will come and enjoy uh, this wonderful, wonderful story. And there, there will be singers. There will be there's a piper. There's a guitarist. Um, Hillary will be there on the fiddle. Um, uh, well, wonderful pianist. Wonderful pianist and uh, and a and a bazooki and a baron. Uh, the Irish drum, and uh, so we, it'll be, it'll be just like session music, but there will, the pub will be next door kind of thing. Yes, there won't be <laughs> yes, but so that's, that's that, and um, I'm really looking forward to it that once is not enough to, to be with Grace, and, uh, oh. and that um, lush ensemble production. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, there are stories worth watching at storycircleatproctors.org, clicking on YouTube, that you can get anytime, whether you're wearing your bunny slippers or not. Mm -hmm. So, um, and soon, the stories that Marnie will be telling here will be joining them if, right. if, if there are no technical difficulties. <laughs> So those are the coming attractions. So, so, so back to, to that, that opening episode of Little Grace. <laughs> Little Grace. She claims that uh, stage, you mm. might say, of yes, the, the ship. And then the, the other stories go on. To You, you hear about when uh, she is married, a, more or less an arranged marriage, to another clan, the O'Flaherty's. And I met an O'Flaherty man this summer who's uh, in Ireland. And... Uh, I had a great time talking with him. He, he took me uh, to where the grave site of uh, Granuel's son, mm -hmm. Tibbet, is uh, Tibbet. in the West Coast. And that son is born of a, yet another marriage uh, later on. And uh, then she goes on to being really, I, I think of her as a Hillary Clinton. <laughs> she's a, she's a, an ambassador to all the clans and to even foreigner, uh, foreign leaders. And she's a political activist. She's trying to hold on to her country at a time when really England is swallowing it. And uh, she, she gets right out there and fights and leads and she gets thrown in prison a couple of times. It's, it's a long and heroic life. Mm -hmm. And it's been a, a great pleasure to walk with her uh, mm -hmm. through those years. And we, we won't give it away the ending, but it, it's fair to say that she does square off with Queen Elizabeth. She, I would say she does square off is a yeah, good way to yeah, put yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, um, so. Elizabeth still wants Ireland, and in the end, she gets it. <laughs> but, uh, but the women see eye to eye, the, this thing of how they can speak together in the Latin language. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite quite remarkable. Well, and, and the the other underlying element, just to give a little bit more background, is that this whole idea of seed and reassign or whatever the English did was to try to. You might explain it because it it was very foreign to the Irish practice, where if you seeded something to the king in the Irish time, the king offered you a lot of benefits, protection and support and all this other stuff. And when the English came in, they didn't guarantee any of that. They just said. I'm the king, I'm the queen, and I got the rights. Uh, it was a little bit of both. They were actually, um, 
way back in maybe the 1100s, I think Henry II was the first one to kind of come in and simply claim, I'm king of Ireland now. And he brought um, aristocratic men who knew a lot about how to take over a country, and he simply planted them. This expression of planting uh, goes all the way through the Irish history where the English were trying to, if we bring a lot of English people in, that'll settle it all down. It, it's sad, it's a sad story, and it's very much the way we settled America mm -hmm. uh, and took it away from the people who were might indigenous. Might is right. <laughs> yeah, might, might proved, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure the word is right, right but yeah, yes. certainly uh, from their perspective. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Mm. And and the English, as the English who came to America and various other countries that came to America, saw themselves as civilized and the Irish as uncivilized. But really, the Irish had a phenomenal uh, system of law and uh, power exchange and leadership, uh, hierarchical, uh, a whole system of government that simply was a different kind of system. And yes, they were clans, and so they fought amongst each other, and we can see clan activity in our world politics even mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. and how uh, it can be destructive because people are fighting against their own people. Mm -hmm. And that'll weaken you in the long run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Mar Marty, when, uh, when you look at, at what you've done with grace and you've got a couple of books that you've written and cds and i and i know you're active in uh you know other kinds of adventures um two questions you could answer either one you know what's on your horizon in terms of another artistic project or how do you keep it all figured out and and, and able to move with it all i mean <laughs> that's the other thing that i'm curious about because i have the same challenge but uh, well, I'm just coming off about a three or four week period where uh, it all looked like it fit on the calendar, <laughs> but I was going there from were boxes for everything. A, a, a brand new Hindu story I was working on for a college class uh, that was quite, quite an emotionally powerful story and took a lot of uh, energy and our, our friend Kent Bushman helped me sort of show up for that the day I had to tell that. And I was doing a Christian story for some uh, Lenten things. And I was teaching storytelling at Schenectady High every day, all day long for about eight days. It was a wonderful residency at the Sales uh, Fine Arts oh, School. Wow. And all of that was, and I just kept, okay, I guess I'll sleep a little bit and take a breath. Well, there was Riverway and Children at the <laughs> and, Well. And <laughs> Riverway and Children at the Well, which is our interfaith uh, teen storytelling. So all of that was crashing in together. Now I've got a little bit of a respite. but um, So I'm not sure I'm the, my oh. husband wouldn't say I'm the best at organizing it all. But something that's coming up on the horizon is, again, something I debuted a little bit of last year, our Finn McCool stories. Ah. And in Portland, Maine... On the 15th of August, I'm doing Shanaki Night oh, at Old Feeney's Tavern, yes, which I took Grace up to last year, and I'm going to get to do a whole set of Finn McCool stories as I did at uh, Story Sunday last year. Mm -hmm. So you're going back to, to Portland to say that word again. I always screw it up. Shanaki. Uh, Shanaki, yeah. Shanaki. Shanaki is the Irish uh, storyteller. Shanaki is the Irish storyteller. Barbara Shanaki. McCarthy considers herself a Shanaki. Okay. Well, I I knew when I could And who tells the Kayleys, which are parties, parties really. Parties. Gatherings around, uh, yeah. around the fire. Shanaki. That's Shanaki. where the term Often came from. Singing, dancing. Mm -hmm. So, you've, you've, so you're, you're going into the Irish legends. I, I do like the Finn McCool stories. There's something about them. He's a male character, un yeah. unlike Grace, but uh, he starts out uh, as many archetypal mythical characters do. You know, Moses got put in a basket and <laughs> sent down the river. Well, uh, Finn McCool's father was murdered shortly before he was born, and so thinking that he his life was in danger too, he was whisked off to live in the woods with his granny, some say, with his aunts, others say. And there's just all these wonderful tales of him finding his own identity, realizing how he is connected to his father and to the Fianna, the king's army that he was, uh, his father was the leader of before he was murdered. And Finn himself becomes the leader of the Fianna. And oh, many, many stories about Finn McCool. 
Well, we'll look forward to those. I, and I, I do have friends in Portland. I could think about maybe making that the excuse, you know, <laughs> uh, just to go. August not that I Not that I travel 300 <laughs> miles for an Irish pub more than <laughs> once or twice in my life. They have a great setup. It's a big upstairs room, and so you can have a beer, or get some food, and bring it up and watch the show. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we, we, we could look for... Uh, you could fill up a bus. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we, we've got our, our Glenn Sunders and Carnies we're working right? on now. We're working so, on it now. Yeah. We're working on it now. We're trying to, trying to mold it up to a little bit, so we don't have to go quite so far. Uh, so you do have things going on in, in, in the summer. Uh, if oh, you two things in the summer that I would love to, well, one well, sure. is in the summer, is a, a, a storytelling camp weekend that I do at Pyramid Life Center. PyramidLife.org is the retreat center on exit 28 near Ticonderoga up in the Adirondacks. It's on a lake, right? On it's right lake. on a beautiful, beautiful lake and there's free kayaks and canoes and um, oh, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. And for a whole weekend we do swaps and we have a concert and we do lots of exercises and workshops and have, have a really good time and lots of time to play. And it's camp food and camp beds, but it's real inexpensive. And uh, pyramidlife.org is a, is a great retreat center I'd plug for all kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. But we have a storytelling weekend. And two Boston area storytelling friends, uh, Kevin Brooks and Laura Packer, come oh, help me out. Oh, Kevin and Laura coming. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, yeah. Fun. We do this annually. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a wonderful weekend. And actually, I, I do some stuff with writing. And I'm not sure even when exactly we'll be showing this on the cable, but uh, April 30th, which is just a couple of weeks away right. now, is uh, a writing workshop that I'm giving all day long on a Saturday. That'll mm. have happened. That will oh, have okay. happened by the yes. time we see the show. Okay, well, we, we try to continue it. So yes. Marnie at MarnieGiller.com can right. give you all the info about stuff coming up. You know, I, I, uh, I have just been transfixed. I realize I've been, I've been uh, like many story listeners, as you've been talking, I've been listening to you, and I've also been going to those other parts of my mind and heart that have been triggered. Uh, but I want to thank you for coming, and, and always thank Kate for being the best Kate she is. Uh, and I'm wondering if we were going to say farewell for now, that we couldn't ask you to bring back the poem and just give us one more listen to that poem, and we will say good night with, with that. Or good afternoon, or, or good morning, depending whatever. on when you're watching. Morning. To look at anything, if you would know that thing, you must look at it long. I'd say stories are something you have to look at long to bring them into your heart and to bring yourself inside of them. And when you do, you'll touch the very peace those stories issue from. How's that? That's just about as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thank Martin. You. Thank you. Thank you for watching, and uh, we hope you tune us in every month. Stories by story by story, sharing the human experience. Good night, and much good cheer. It goes all my life a circle, sunrise and sundown. The moon rolls through the night time. Till the daybreak comes around And all my life's a circle I can't tell you why Seasons spinning